Hey everybody, put the kids to bed because it's time for the sexy. This audio upload is going to be all about 50 Shades of Grey in honor of the release of the movie, including a few issues related to it and what we call chick flicks as a whole, and most importantly, the fact that this movie is expected to gross large amounts of money while everyone, and I mean everyone, is calling it terrible. What the heck is that all about? Well, we'll get directly into that. Okay, first of all, you don't have to put the kids to bed. This is all PG, and I actually have not read Fifty Shades of Grey. Instead, I want to talk about the phenomena surrounding it, with all the bad reviews and the huge box office, because it's actually a pattern we've seen before that I think is pretty interesting, and it's something that I think people write off too easily. In any situation, when you have something show up that seems not to make sense or contradicts our understanding, those are the situations where we have data that we should pay the most attention to. I feel like people will often default to something like, well, people are dumb and they like dumb movies, then not think about it anymore. But if we do think about that a little more, we can start to see that it's obviously not true. After all, if you go to imdb.com, the internet movie database, and look at their bottom 100 rated movies, you're going to see a lot of unsuccessful films that clearly didn't have much time or thought put into them. So the idea that people would like a movie because it's dumb doesn't apply in every circumstance. There's a lot of movies that you would call dumb that are also unsuccessful, while there are some that get the same label but are very successful. So if we just hand wave it away and say that people like dumb movies or that people are dumb, we're dismissing some key bit of info with a blanket untrue statement. We really need, I think, to break out our hammer and chisel and really try to figure out how some movies can be reviewed as really bad and yet do a huge number in the box office. Which hopefully answers the question of why we'd be spending a huge amount of time talking about this in the first place, especially for people who might think Fifty Shades of Grey wouldn't be worth any other analysis. But it is, and I think it's especially because it fits a common pattern of anomalies in our normal understanding that the best movies, the most well-made intellectual and so on, which get the best critical reviews, are the ones that make the most money. Or that the movies that are the most entertaining make the most money. The second statement fits much more with what we see, but even that mold can't fit what we've observed entirely. Because most people don't find Fifty Shades of Grey entertaining. And most people didn't find Twilight entertaining and especially not intellectual. You see, there's this common pattern, consistently defying traditional expectations, which demonstrates that there are some different principles that keep bearing out. Fifty Shades of Grey, terrible reviews, huge money. Twilight, the same thing. Before that, though, there was Titanic, which for a long time was the biggest grossing movie ever. And of course, other movies like Dirty Dancing, which is actually not that highly rated on IMDb, I believe it's under a 7.0, but the final dance sequence from it has well over a hundred million views on YouTube, which is insane. And despite all of it, there's not really any indication from comments or reviews that these movies are any good. So the first question, or the first assumption that I think we should consider, is whether or not these movies are actually bad. Before we say anything about that, though, I don't think we need to go passing judgment on it. And I'll get into this in that last introduction video that's coming up. I don't really want to declare that Fifty Shades and the others we're discussing are bad movies. For this channel, I'm not really interested in trying to dictate what people should or shouldn't like. Instead, I think it's more fun and interesting to give reasons why we might not like something or like something. Instead, I think it's more fun and interesting to give reasons why we might like or not like what we do. But we'll get into that in that video. As far as this goes, instead, we can just acknowledge that popular opinion about the book and the movie is that they aren't any good at all. Okay, so with that in mind, the average person, by definition, is of normal intelligence. So it doesn't really serve us to imagine that there's some failing there, especially when we get to things that large numbers of people like over time such as Twilight continuing to make money over all of its sequels. It's the same thing as the political saying that you can't fool all the people all the time. If Twilight and Titanic and Fifty Shades of Grey were genuinely terrible movies, they might do some opening box office, but people would catch on, and you wouldn't see the return business. 
In a lot of ways, I've always considered the best measure of a movie commercially to be the second weekend and not the first, since the first is the product of marketing and other things that show how many people expected to enjoy it, while the second weekend introduces the objective opinion of the first viewers to either boost the movie or lower it by word of mouth. And by that test, these movies, which you might call tween chick flick phenomenons, or in the case of Fifty Shades of Grey, an adult chick flick, maybe, they do absolutely fine. They don't have any kind of abnormal drop-off in their second weekend. So, by all indications, there is something there. These movies have something of real quality that they're offering the audience. And if we go by the fundamental purpose of storytelling, which of course I do, since I made a whole video about it, we know that the thing is a positive feeling. And it's obvious what it is, because these are romance movies, or romance slash erotica. So the feelings they offer are going to be romantic ones. That vicarious pleasure of meeting the perfect man and dating and falling in love with him. That's obviously there. But now, we said that the general public isn't stupid. But that also means that the critics aren't either. When you look at the bad reviews and comments people make about the movie, if they do go into detail, they bring up real things that are problems with the story. They're being honest, but they're actually having a different experience watching the same movie. Because these movies actually appeal to much narrower slices of the population. What they portray is a romance aimed entirely at creating romantic attachment to the male character. And, and that's actually a side point. You can tell if a romantic movie is aimed at women or men by looking to see which character in the romance is less interesting. If the man has very little personality and is more of a blank slate or every man, and the woman is super good looking or confident or aggressive or funny or something else, then that movie is made for men. Likewise, if the female doesn't say anything or have much expression, while the man happens to be a sparkling vampire or werewolf with washboard abs or a young handsome billionaire who's into ropes and handcuffs, then it's for the female audience. You're supposed to gain the same feelings for the love interest in these movies as the main character in the movie does. Thus, naturally, if you have no romantic interest in men, you're going to miss the entire appeal of Fifty Shades of Grey. So, instead, you end up focusing on other things that we see when we watch movies. And in the case of these, if they have a few flaws, or more than a few, as Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey apparently do, you're only going to notice those flaws, and you'll have a very negative opinion about the whole movie with nothing to redeem it if you don't have the romantic feeling. So, I think a lot of these times when we have these disagreements about whether a movie is good, we get caught up in the idea of kind of personalizing people's opinions and assuming people are being dishonest or foolish just because they disagree with us, when in fact, both people on either side of the disagreement, especially when it comes to the quality of a movie, are accurately reflecting the way they feel about what they watched. But on top of that, one side may be more vocal than the other. But we'll get to that in a second. Right now, we do know that there are a lot of people for whom these types of movies do nothing. In a lot of ways, this goes against what we normally see from mass market movies. Because mass market movies cost so much that they thus can't afford to limit their potential audience. They try to have something for everybody. So I think the question then naturally becomes, how are these movies with automatically smaller audiences so successful if they're limited like that? Answering this is cool, because we get to talk about an idea that I like to call deep appeal. There's wide appeal, of course, where you have as high a percentage of the population as you can as potential fans of the movie. But deep appeal is when you appeal to a smaller percentage of people but you appeal to them so much that they are far more likely to see the movie, spread the word of mouth to others, and even buy multiple tickets. Since if you only appeal to 50% of the population, but they each see the movie twice, you've made 100% of the money that a broad movie that only gets one view each will make. Similarly, if the broad movie has 100% of the potential audience, but only draws in, say, 40% of them, a movie that appeals to half the population, but gets 95% of them to show up, will actually make more money. So, this is a very viable option, actually. If you can pick the right smaller audience, or you know the movie will work. This isn't necessarily something that you can do reliably, or know reliably, which is why I think studios try to avoid this when there are hundreds of millions of dollars on the line. 
But when you can pull it off, you can make the same amounts. This is actually precisely why Tyler Perry has been so successful, but that's another topic entirely. In the case of Fifty Shades of Grey, what it offers in terms of feelings is something that naturally would have this deep appeal because movies go for it so rarely that the audience that likes it, in this case adult age women who are rarely the target of sex-based advertising, end up having a sort of unscratched itch in that territory. Precisely because they have their sex button ignored so often by the media, a chance for a good turn on is something that probably will really stand out. And from what I understand, I of course can't judge personally, Fifty Shades of Grey is a really good turn on. Thus, the audience that hears about this and sees the movie and likes it are really going to see it as a more rare thing and thus are much more likely to tell their friends about it or even see it more than once. So the movie hits that higher percentage of the audience. On top of that, because the target audience likely appreciates the rarity of the movie, they're probably much more likely to forgive any failures the movie might have in believability. I think this is a great example of how the idea of layering works as opposed to feature bias. Looking at the various effects of a book or movie and how that can show you so much more about what's going on instead of focusing on one or two things you notice, which is why I spend so much time on feature bias. There's an important point that I'm going to go into later, but to say in a short way now, the actual effects of a movie. The different things a movie can do for you as a viewer can be ranked where some give you a more positive experience than others. And a movie not being believable is one of the things that hurts the experience the most. So without anything to make up for it, cheesy, hard to believe romance movies come off totally awful to people who don't get the romance. However, the people who do get the romance fail in the believability category, but deliver on the romantic side and thus still get a net positive experience. This includes though, something else entirely which relates. Because another of the most important effects which actually outranks our sexual or romantic enjoyment is the feeling of confirmation. If a movie in some way or another underlines or backs up what we want to be true, that gives us a very good feeling too. If we want to believe that it's okay for women to have intense sexual desires and great sex lives, then movies that appeal to that in women, like Fifty Shades of Grey, will carry additional value and give an even stronger positive experience. And perhaps you can see how this makes for a very strong gulf between how women and men will view this movie. On top of that, there's even more layered in when we consider that people may want to believe it's okay for movies to be made that cater to their sexual interests as females. This is an additional feeling of confirmation, and these things are swirling together in people watching the movie. Hopefully this helps to demonstrate just how many things are going on when people react to a story. With some thought, we can start to identify a half dozen or even a dozen key factors that can be catered to or tweaked if we're the ones writing the story, or it can be acknowledged and discussed if we're watching or reading it. So feature bias, looking at only one thing, is really, really important to avoid so that we can have this learning process, either for our own writing or just for the fun of learning. Now really though, we've only listed a few things that describe what's going on in an overall context with the movie. To get specific, of course, we'd have to watch it, and, you know, it's not my cup of tea as a guy. But to get an even fuller view of the picture, we can stay in this overall context. We could get super specific, too, and look at associations and biases and beliefs that individual people have. But that goes so deep that there are professionals who get paid to do it. And there's so much there that the results of an individual person watching a movie without knowing anything else can sometimes be totally impossible to predict. Fortunately though, on large scales, there are enough common factors that we can identify clear things that are going on, and we can continue to do that here. We talked about some of what's going on with women, but there's also additional things going on with the detractors. Most commonly, the men or boys who have an almost tangible hate for these types of movies and bash the heck out of them, to the point that at first glance, it might not even seem to make any sense how much they bash them. After all, if they don't like the movie, why don't they just ignore it, like they do daytime soap operas or other female empowerment projects? What is it that's going on here that turns them into a pitchfork-wielding mob that's actively on the attack? Well, as we said, 
People are having genuinely different experiences watching these movies, including the trailers and the commercials and everything surrounding them. When these people who don't like the movie consult their inner compass, the overall feeling they have that dictates what we think about the quality of something, whether we know it or not, which is its own topic also, well, from that, these people are getting a genuinely negative score for their feeling from the movie. This means, and this is really important, this means that to these people, Fifty Shades of Grey is a genuinely bad movie with nothing to offer. And yet and still, it is succeeding. It's getting attention, it's making money, it's drawing fans and everything else. And we have, as humans, an innate moral sense to see that things that are bad do not succeed. If we think that something does not deserve the success it's getting, we get the urge to do something about it. In this case, to speak out. So you see, it's not that they can simply avoid the movie. It's not about their own choice. It's about the natural human urge to right wrongs. To their instincts, they are fighting something evil. So it's not enough on a visceral gut level for them to simply ignore the movie. They have to speak out and fight it. And in many ways, feature bias is causing this too because they only see what they notice, usually the lack of believability in the whole thing, and they thus pass judgment that the whole movie has nothing to offer, which creates the moral urge to actively fight the movie's success. Now, we can add to this, because on top of fighting the success of something we think is bad, this is a romance movie, which means that in addition to moral urges, which can come from both men and women who think the movie is bad, we're going to get mating urges involved too. And within those mating urges, men are naturally threatened by women becoming attracted to other men. Because if the women like that guy, that means they don't like us. It hurts our own reproductive chances. So if some actor or some movie is drawing all the women to go see it, and they're all turned on by it or romantically interested in it, it's going to trigger that same instinct to defend our own reproductive chances by knocking down this object of the women's interest. You can probably imagine how this applies to the hatred at Justin Bieber. And in fact, when I was in fourth grade, we used to spend a lot of time trying to convince the girls in the class that the new kids on the block were all gay. It's a very immature example of the same phenomenon, but it's something pretty revealing, since in a lot of cases, our juvenile behaviors reveal our base instincts in the most raw form. So now, with that in mind, I as a fan may bash the movie because I think it doesn't deserve the success, or I might be someone else and bash the movie because of these reproductive instincts, or both, which would make me bash the movie even more. So we see that there's going to be this vocal opposition to the movie, this strong vocal opposition to this particular movie and movies like Twilight that hit a lot of the same buttons. But you may notice also that the positive word of mouth doesn't seem to be there counteracting it. Fifty Shades of Grey has made a ton of money already, so obviously it's really, really popular. But I don't know any of its fans. It's like that Chris Rock joke when he said that the Spice Girls had sold 10 million albums, but he couldn't find one person who would admit to buying it. The fans exist, the numbers prove it, but they're almost invisible. This is a huge contrast to something like Star Wars or a lot of other smaller films with cult fan bases that spread them everywhere publicly. The public statements about this movie, despite the popularity, seem to be almost 100% negative. So what gives there? Well, now we'll dip back into our social instincts for two more things. First is our natural contrarian urge. If something is very popular, we lose the urge to admit to liking it because it makes us seem unoriginal. Everyone likes to believe that we think for ourselves. We don't do things solely because others tell us to do them. Nor do we think things just to copy other people. So naturally, the more other people seem to like something, the more often we will assume that the thing is not as good or show others that we ourselves don't care for it. In practice, this means that the people who don't like Fifty Shades of Grey will be very vocal, while the other side, the people who like it, very often won't say a word. This means that the amount of feedback we get in others' vocal opinions will be unnaturally weighted towards the negative, and we have to look instead toward the box office, where people don't have to announce what they've seen, to get a real feel for what's going on. Of course, though, some of these social factors can work in different ways. 
There is definitely such a thing as peer pressure, going to see something because a friend likes it so you keep them company, or you just don't want them to be unhappy with you if you refuse. This may actually cause a popular movie to do a bump in business, but it's not going to make those people also publicly claim to like the movie, especially when their friend isn't around. So I don't think it will contribute in any notable amount to the comments we hear and read about people liking or not liking the movie. Also, as a side note, things like peer pressure are more minor factors in something's success, since the movie or book has to create a buzz first, draw in the first person, before that person can drag in their friends. So appealing to people for actual emotional reasons will still take precedence, and causing group phenomena in some way, however you want to look at it, will probably be a secondary or minor thing at best. Alright now, one more thing to mention, which deals specifically with the genre we're talking about, and also causes the disparity in what we hear about the movie and its box office, which is that movies that give romantic feelings also cause us to deal with them the same way we deal with our romantic feelings in real life. And in real life, we have a very deep and instinctive urge to hide our romantic interest. Going back to grade school, it's why you never tell anyone but your closest friends who your crush is, and why we tend to flirt in veiled comments and quick glances instead of loud proclamations, and of course, famously, why the best way to ask someone out is to pass them a note that they can answer with a checkbox instead of speaking. It's because Giving away your romantic interest, letting the group know about it, is making an offer to someone else. And if that person doesn't like you, or otherwise rejects the offer, that kills your value to everyone else. Who would want to date someone who was already rejected by another person they liked? On top of that, who would want to look like a second choice like that? It hurts both the rejected person and whoever they might end up dating, and thus, makes them almost like a leper in terms of reproduction, which to our instincts is the same as life and death. So, we use what the CIA might call plausible deniability. We flirt in ways that can easily be claimed not to have been actual interest, in case our interest isn't returned. We conceal our romantic urges, even our strongest ones, toward others unless or until they are safely returned. Thus, movies that trigger those romantic urges we also conceal our interest toward. People who get those crush feelings toward Fifty Shades of Grey are not going to tell the public about it for those reasons. When they're amongst friends who might be able to help those romantic interests, or in this case, message boards and fan groups, sure, we'll be all over the place with avatars and cute sayings and all kinds of things letting our feelings out, but not to non-allies. This contributes hugely to this hush effect. So what we have here are a large number of circumstances. People will bash movies like Twilight, Titanic, and Fifty Shades of Grey because they genuinely don't feel that it's good, because they have a moral sense that it doesn't deserve its success, or that they have a natural urge to attack the object of the opposite sex's interest, and probably more reasons. On the other hand, people will not speak about their support for these movies because they don't want to seem unoriginal for liking something that's well known, because they naturally hide their romantic interests in things, or even for other simpler reasons, like that they don't feel like fighting with the people who are bashing it. What's really key though, to me, is to see how all these things fit together. None of them are solely responsible for what's going on, but instead, they play off of and compete with each other, and ultimately have a net effect in terms of what we see in the culture as a whole. Just like how the various things going on in a movie do this with our emotions, and create a net effect that is our reaction to the film, whether we know it or not. But recognizing this, seeing this tapestry of things, is really the beauty of it, at least to me. It can help us develop new tricks and ideas, or learn to use data more effectively. Like here, for example, knowing that certain negative feedback is overemphasized and not coming from your target demographic, and thus not the concern that it otherwise would be. One of the best quotes I've read is a Hindu proverb about chess, saying that it's an ocean in which a gnat can drink and an elephant can bathe. That's exactly the thing that draws me to these kinds of studies. What we get from Fifty Shades of Grey can be as simple as blindfolds and ropes might be fun to try out in the bedroom, or as detailed as what we've been talking about here, or even beyond that, to things we don't even know yet. 
And that's also true for so many other things, and many other movies and books, and the ideas behind them. Hopefully we were just able to demonstrate with this one specific example just how much depth there really is, and how interesting and really wonderful it can be to learn. Okay, I really hope you enjoyed listening to this one. I intend to continue moving between videos and the visual things they can offer to help illustrate points, and content like this, which doesn't ask as much and thus can be heard while you're doing other things. And I've got some more stuff to start next. You can follow me on Twitter at StoryBrain1 or on Facebook, or just stay subscribed to the channel, and you will know about all of it the minute it goes up. Thanks.